when I talk about this Tennessee game, Jake, uh, it's 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 so disappointing on so many levels. Uh, but probably the most disappointing part about this game was just the actual beginning of the game because this was a day in which the vibes were immaculate. I get to the early kickoff, people are upset, whatever, but the weather was astounding. Everybody tailgating seemed in a great mood. Like, that was a stadium that was ready to watch some entertainment, and even though we did not feel good about this game coming in, I was, you know, like like someone thrown overboard and uh, floating in the sea, Jake. I was clinging on to the life raft of, well, Vegas has this game at three, Mm -hmm. and then it went to two and a half. So, like, if nothing else, we should get a battle. Well, when you're trying to beat a team that is better than you and you're trying to affect an upset, you cannot afford to make too many mistakes. You have to play near perfect hope that they make mistakes. You cannot afford to make the literal most impactful bad mistake that you could make from the literal first play of the game. And make no mistake about it, that is... What is so disappointing to me is that for all that buildup, all that positive energy, positive vibes that were in the air, it was immediately ruined, and you immediately lost the game. And and, and I know that, look, you still have to play the game. There's a lot of football left to be played, et cetera, and, and that's fine, and that's fine. Like, I'm not going to sit here and argue with you. But from my view, when you fumble that kickoff and you give that team an extra possession, they score within 30 seconds, uh, you're not getting the ball after halftime. You are never, ever. I don't care even if Dre Jenkins makes that catch to make it 20 to 14. You are never winning that game after that beginning. And that's what sucks so bad. It was like, I, I, again, this is an analogy that's maybe just a bit personal, but it reminds me of some of those Pelican season over the past like half decade where I would build myself up all off season and then they would go like one in 10 to start. And you're like, okay, well, it's over. Like we got months more basketball. Like I'm sitting here, okay, I got three more hours of this football game to watch and I already know that it's over. And that was an awful feeling. It was. And, like, if you were trying to get to your seat or if you were trying to go from the sideline <laughs> to the press box, it's like, okay, well, you, you know, you kind of get off the field right before the opening kick, and by the time you got into the press box, it was 10 to nothing. Yeah. Like, you're like, wait a minute, else you got the ball first. How did that happen? And it, it just it can't happen. Okay, now you're going to have plays sometimes where really good players just fumble the ball, and and we can get to all that. But, like, there was confusion, like, which player was supposed to be where. Like, they're pointing at each other, and then and then Besh kind of waves him off. He's like, no, I'll, I'll get right here. And they weren't prepared for, like, no, a sky pulled, kick they, situation. Well, so, like, okay, so Kelly says, okay, so the ball falls off the tee, and the guy that they bring in to hold the ball came from the left side of the field. So Kelly's like, oh, they're going to kick it right. So then they try to switch Besh. Uh, they try to switch the returners last second. They do that. Tennessee's kicking into the wind, so it turns into like a sky kick of sorts. Uh, just a, 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 a cavalcade of errors. At that point, like you should have just stuck, just, just stood pat. Yeah, because just stood pat. Every there was time, no need to switch. Every time I've ever been in that situation, if a ball falls off a tee, regardless of who, which R1, L1, whoever's coming to hold that, you have two returners. You have a returner, you have an off returner. Okay, well, then you get on the same level and then you scoot up seven to 10 yards. Yeah. And that's how you handle a ball falling off the tee. Because if you oh, do, really then yeah. you have two guys right there and you have you don't have to switch and you have the ability because you have two returners back there. Now, the off returner is never going to be necessarily like a guy that's going to take it to the house, but he's back there for a reason. And so you scoot up, you even out, and that's how you handle that situation. Yeah, exactly. And you talk about getting your your best. And, that, and that's the other part about it that's a bit interesting is Kelly talked about they, they tried to do that switch with best uh, because they wanted their best guy. To catch it, but your best guy isn't really that good. And I don't mean that as a slight against Besh. What I'm saying is nobody sees Jack Besh in the return game and is like, ooh, that's somebody that we need to avoid kicking to. Like like going out of your way to put the ball in his hands doesn't make a ton. Like making the switch there, what you're saying, right. And again, yeah, this the, Jack didn't start the season there. Yeah, like you're talking about if you have a Trendon Holiday. Yeah, and they're trying to kick away from him. They're trying to be. You creative. do everything you can exactly. to try to make them get to get the ball Trendon hand. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I, look, I played with Darren Sproles. Yeah. I played with Trendon Holiday both. Yeah. I played Trendon in college <laughs> and the NFL. I was the all fraternal. Like I realized that we had to be creative in, in what we did back there to try to get those guys the ball. 
Never forget Will Blackwell once fair caught a ball in front of Trinan Holiday. With Trinan Holiday, he got he got he got it in the film room for that. But you know what Will did do? He caught the ball. Okay? So there was no turnover uh for whatever that is worth. So yeah, I mean, just an awful beginning. And, and you know what? You know what? The only because look, when we talk about the fourth downs, uh, I get that these are objectively bad decisions because the result did not work out. That said, I can engage with the context. I, I see some of them as more maybe 50-50 than others. Like, I can understand how you arrived there, and a lot of it is just the implied threat of the Tennessee offense, which we'll get to. But, Jake, the only objectively bad decision that I just absolutely cannot get behind is why you chose to receive the ball. And you can accuse me of being too results-oriented as well because, well, I mean, you know, you uh, of, of – of course, you're now questioning that because you fumbled it and they scored 30 seconds into the game. But no, but I'm just saying when the strength of your team is the defense mm -hmm. and the offense has been struggling, why uh, would you put the struggling unit out there? Uh, and and because because of the way LSU's offense uh, has played up to this point in the season, right, without even the context of the Tennessee game, like even putting the offense out there, there's a great chance they go three and out and just punt the ball anyway. So like I just don't know what how I guess I guess you just had like a way more faith in the offense than we did on this side not being a practice not seeing things right because that's the only way that you can make that decision make sense because let's say you kick it whatever you go down seven nothing that is what it is that I mean that's Tennessee that's what you're gonna have to deal with every single drive and haven't we seen with LSU this year and all throughout the country, the combinations that you can pull in before half situations, knowing you get the ball back to start the second half. And why do you want that offense to get the ball to start the second half? Like that is the only decision that I think is 100% objectively wrong. Uh, even if you don't get punished with the worst case scenario, I think that's wrong. Even if you score three off the jump, like you drive and score three, I still don't love that decision. And uh, it was very head scratching to me. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people were were shocked by that. And your defense, like they they tried to be, at the beginning of the game, they would just put in awful, awful yeah. situations. And so, like you look up, it's like, man, defense gave up 500 yards. But it's like early in that game, like they're trying to help you get back into that game. And like you said, T, they've been playing like the better unit. It hasn't been close really all season long. And so, like in your thought process, yes, you give Tennessee the ball, you get it at half. Because you put your best foot forward, you put your best unit out there, and you you know you pin Tennessee back with a kickoff. They start in the twenty-five, whatever it might be, make them go seventy-five yards, and you didn't do that. And you know then you have the fumble. Then your defense has their back against the wall time and time again to start that game because of the fumble, because of the punt return. Yeah. And they tried. I mean, they tried. They held them to two field goals there. I thought that was like okay, if you're ever going to get back in the game, it has to be now because the defense is done their part and obviously you never were and that was kind of a head scratching move to not put your best unit out there yeah I mean it, it is odd where you, I, I tweeted at the time and a bunch of Tennessee fans were clowning me but I do I mean Sam Biden was like it, it was 13 nothing it was like man the defense is actually playing spectacular right now uh even though it's 13 I mean, to zero five minutes into at, the game. at that point they were because of the situations and the sudden change that they had been put into because of two very poor special teams plays, the fumble and the return. I mean, that's not the first return either. No. I mean, there's been a ton of space in the punt return game against LSU all season long. Uh, okay, look, we're going to continue to break this game down, uh, where we're wrong, what could be better, what what, what do we kind of view as uh, the ongoing things that need to be fixed. I, I, I will also say this, obviously, uh, we do – local radio right so we are going to approach this from the lsu viewpoint very egocentric viewpoint uh but if i was to take a bird's eye view this game is way more about tennessee right and and and, and becoming and really establishing themselves as a legitimate top 10 team right going into a hostile environment as the favorite and just handling business in 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 the most workmanlike efficient and deadly manner and the threat that's something I want to talk about the the kind of differences between the two offense the threat that the Tennessee offense the 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 force that it exerts on the game Hendon Hooker um the just all-out aggressive style on both sides of the ball it makes him a very 
Interesting team to watch. And and everybody laughed a couple weeks ago, Jake, when we talked about who's the fourth best team in the country. And I, I kind of landed on Tennessee. And it wasn't because I think they're going to make the playoff or anything. But it was like, okay, once you get inside the big three, who would you take over them in a head-to-head matchup? And I'm not still saying that there's not teams that you would or whatever. There's conversations there. But they do look as sharp as uh, anybody, especially when they put it together like they did this weekend. Um, so we'll continue to break it down, though, from – the LSU perspective more off the bench next. Uh, Jake, I'll let you start this segment because there's a lot of talk about protection uh, going on in the chat right now. And look, you know, let's let's, let's be clear. Um, uh, this game was also tinged with a very scary and very unexpected absence of your you know your stalwart left tackle who's been one of the best parts of this team thus far and losing him early on in the manner that you did, especially the day before is a, is a, is a, is a big blow for sure. And then losing Garrett Dellinger who has been your best uh, offensive lineman outside of him. That, that as well uh, is a big blow. I understand that. I still um, refuse to accept that it should be as bad as it was even with that. So Jake, what did you want to talk about uh, protection wise here? Yeah, we're just going to show one clip, and this is actually with Dellinger still in the game. Tennessee was getting home with basic stunts like TEs and ET. So TE tackle before the end, ET and before the tackle. And on this one, and I'll, I'll try to explain it so the radio audience understands as well. Okay, so you have your defensive tackle, three shade, outside of your left guard, Garrett Dellinger, Okay. You look at the defensive end right here on the edge, number 19 for Tennessee. Look at the difference in depth. Okay, so your defensive tackle, he's on the line of scrimmage, your defensive end is a full step back from your defensive tackle, okay? Every offensive lineman in America should know that they're about to run a TE stunt. Yeah. It's by their alignment. It's the way they're lined up. You should be screaming, stunt, stunt, stunt. And this continued time and time again to get LSU. This is not, I mean, we could really, T, we could run it back. We could pull up five of these. And it's basic. You and I could get out there, you because you're an offensive lineman, me because I played enough punt, where we could get up there. You could be a guard, I could be a tackle, we can flip-flop, it doesn't matter. We would be calling this out, and we'd also set to this. What I mean by set to this is, if we're the guard, we are not turning both of our shoulders no. to the defensive tackle, knowing that at some point the defensive end is going to loop back into yeah. the rush. And as we let this video play, Danny, that's too much. That's too easy for Tennessee. Your guard gets both of his numbers turned to the sideline, which in protection you should never do. As a running back, as a tight end, as a tackle, a guard, yeah. anybody. Well, that's a basic, basic stunt. Like as soon as... By alignment, you should know, but as soon as number 20 right there, right, you don't turn your whole body, and you're waiting on 19 to come because if you turn your body that much, it doesn't take a great defensive end to be able to get to the quarterback, but this is a speed rusher as well. So you give him that much room, this is what he's going to do. And it all can be sorted out before the snap. You should, by alignment, know that this is coming. So if I'm Dellinger, if I'm the guard... I'm giving good outside hand presence to that defensive tackle. My numbers, you should see the seven and the two from the end zone copy, and then I work right back into the defensive end coming in. Yeah, I mean, even even if you don't see a pre-snap, uh, ideally your technique should carry you here uh, if y'all are kicking uh, to the same depth. Like you said, if you're staying more square in your pass set and not over committing to that punch, flipping your hips to the sideline and basically opening that door uh, maybe Bradford should have seen it earlier on, even bumped. It, I guess the reason why it's so disappointed me is I felt like they've actually been pretty good at passing off games for the majority of this Bradford year. Bradford actually today, does. They just couldn't do he it. does bump. Look, I mean, his, his look, 75. No, Bradford's fine. Bradford's fine. That's he's what I'm saying. Square, it's square. He and he's trying yeah. already to get to 20, knowing what they're trying to do. And Danny, go back to the very beginning. I mean, the depth isn't even really close. I mean, look, he is a step, uh, uh, you know, a fr- in front of the, what is that, 25 yard line? And you got your defensive end is like his right foot's at twenty six, 
I mean, you're talking about a full yard and a half, two yards no, difference Brad, in depth. Brad, well, no, and Bradford definitely feels that, but Dellinger's not. Dellinger's thinking, I got this guy one-on-one. He's, he doesn't he's see all it. in on He the, doesn't see it at all. Now, that yeah, could be. he's all in on the one-on-one. Some of that's communication from Bradford, right? He's got to be like, hey, twist, 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 because he sees the depth. Now, Dellinger should as well. But, T, I mean, you know this. That is, that's like day one install. So I realize that Bradford is, is new-ish out here at left tackle. He's played it before, but he hasn't played a ton of it. Dellinger started like it shouldn't matter. Like any any five of the offensive linemen could be in this position, and they should by depth be calling this out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the 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 the, the sin is overcommitting. Uh, th- just convincing yourself that you're you're one on one there and that you could overcommit right. to that and, punch. But that, and if they do twist, that you could recover. Which those twists. I mean, we can. I'll, I'll try to pull up another one before we get out of, the, uh, of hour number one. They continued to get home time and time again. I actually tweeted. I'm like, they saw something on tape where LSU wasn't going to make the adjustment based off what they saw from, you know, twists in prior games. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's representative of a larger um, problem in which LSU's offense, despite some volume statistics, uh, just felt so ineffective and clunky. And really, it's a, it's a continuation of what has been the majority of this season, save for some good quarters, um, unfortunately, now when you just do the math, the majority of this season, that's exactly what this LSU offense has been clunky and ineffective. And, and there, if you're wondering why, well, how they end up with the 300 pass yards, whatever against Tennessee, uh, well, look, Tennessee's all out aggressive style is not just offensive, defensively as well. Um, they want to blitz, they, they, they wanted to come after LSU and force you to make the plays. What that means is, yes, you may give up chunk yardage and spurts. But they're banking on their offense, applying enough pressure, and their defense creating enough negative plays that that yardage will be empty yardage at the end of the day. And that's exactly what it was here. So I don't really care about throwing for 300 pass yards or anything because it was never, um, it just never felt good. It never felt like you were dictating the pace of the game. And and to me, the, the thing that has stood out to me more than anything, Jake, and I talked about it on Whiskey and Wine. I talked about it this morning real quick with Dick Condon on uh, Eagle and, and Scott. Is It's something that Chase James, my boy, said to me at Don Juan. We're, we're, we're chilling. We're watching the game. And he's like, man, it's just it, just watching these two offenses in the same football game, like philosophically, as an LSU fan, just feels so bad. It feels like they are driving a Lamborghini and you are driving like a Ford Pinto or something. I mean, you just feel so pedestrian and old and they feel so cutting edge and threatening is the word that I keep coming back to, right? There is no danger presented to the opponent right now by the LSU offense. There are no explosive plays. Like there's outside of Jaden Daniels running the ball, there is nothing that a defense has to actually be concerned about. Tennessee, the polar opposite is true. You have to be concerned about everything because at any single moment, Hendon Hooker can come for your throat. And you saw that. They create the turnover. Next thing you know, what do they do? Deep touch on where? To the left side. Tendency breaker. We, we showed it to you before the game. Jake did an excellent job of bringing up the pass chart on Friday. A very visual representation of where you could expect Hooker to go with the ball. What do great players do? They showed that they can break those tendencies. They can make you play where you think they won't. He did just that. LSU does None of that. And look, some of that's personnel. Certainly. I understand that. But I do also think that's still a very supreme. Like, what would LSU receivers be doing in that Tennessee offense? It'd be it would be a sight to behold. They would be raising the 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 towns. They would travel to an SEC town, burn it to the ground, and then leave with all the women and children weeping in their wake. It's 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 so wild that you cannot come up with a better way to take advantage of the best position group on your team. And honestly, I know everybody's down on polling and special teams right now, and obviously I understand why. I come out of this game pretty down on Denbrock and the offensive philosophy. Uh, this is an offense that I, I, I do think should be better. And it's an offense that, hey, and maybe it's just against the harsh glare of that orange sun, but it's an offense that this week especially feels as old and plotting and boring as it has felt since 2018, really. It's been a few years. We got used to being a little high-flying, a little spread, and now, now it kind of feels like we're uh, 
taking steps back in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I'm trying to get a still shot of Tennessee's offense, and certainly we can do it throughout the show. I mean, they just – okay, so you, you go out there and you see what they're doing as far as their width, and we talked about it all week. But, I mean, they try to get their receivers so close to the sideline because they want to yeah, open up so the cool. middle of the field. And they, they come in with a rhyme, with a reason, with a plan, and that's their plan. And if you try to adjust to it, what do they do? Well, they're just going to turn around. Hinton Hooker's going to hit the receiver that's behind the pinpoint receiver, and they're going to get seven yards. And yeah. if you want to take it away – Fine, we're going to run our offense, and so well. And then if you, yeah, if you commit to the defending the flanks, well, then we're just going to run the ball. And you saw how that went on Saturday. They get you in light box. It's it's yeah, like all great ideas in life, Jake. In its basis, elevator pitch, it's very simple. It's like you said, put guys as wide as possible. If they have five in the box, run it. You know, if, if, if they keep guys in the box, well, then you can throw it. Now, can you execute and all these things? Yes, but in its basis, distilled down since, it is just that. It, it is them creating advantages numbers-wise. Yeah, and it's look, it's it's a little, I don't want to say unorthodox because there's other teams doing it. Hell, we faced it in the third-grade flag team at Traction last week. They ran the same offense. Hell, yeah. They put dude. four receivers out there. They stack behind each other, and they try to create space, and they run three-step slants and go routes, and they make you defend – you know, one or the other, and whichever one you choose, they're going to do the other. Yeah, so that's what Newheiser was saying last week. Is that, yeah, so once you get past the, okay, do we run or pass, then it's, okay, you, you, you figure out which side of the field you're going to numbers-wise, and then it's just a high-low 50-50 decision, yeah. like Jake is talking Danny, about Danny, I just there. sent you that picture, uh, Twitter. If, if you can pull it up whenever you get a chance and, and kind of give a visual of what we're talking about because they just they ran who they are and what got them to that point and anytime you made an adjustment to it, they just went with the with the counterpunch. Yeah. And the counterpunch was working every time. Like a lot of times counterpunches don't work. Like you're doing it because you're in trouble. Well, anytime you took away what they wanted to do, they just ended up counterpunching and it was effective. I mean, look at this. I mean, you have they're at the top of the numbers at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> but on the top of the screen, like you just don't see people lined up this wide. I mean, they are right on the side. I mean, look at LSU's corner Bruh. at the top. I mean, he is Talk basically on the sideline. So look at all this. Look at these two alleys. These two alleys right here. And look, you have to defend it this way. But you see these two alleys right here. And if I'm a running back and I see a six-man box like this with these two alleys, I'm just licking, licking my chops. Job. And that's why Tennessee is able to run for over 200 yards. That's why they're able to complete these. Look, if this receiver here blocks him, this receiver here blocks him, you throw it to your guy, there's so much space. <laughs> and it's all about spacing, and it's about timing, and it's about you know running your offense and being effective and making adjustments if they take something away. And Tennessee came out here, and they had so much room, and they did this time and time again. That's who they are. And we're running tight formations with a true freshman tight end because you're telling me that you have to have a tight end on the field. It's – um. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, Jake, so then you combine this with the fact that they do it at a million miles an hour. A million miles an hour where the quarterback's going to be a Sunday player. And, it, and it's just, it's a perfect story. I See, like, a lot of people were like, can you imagine this offense uh, if they had Tillman? Tillman's a fantastic football player. I think he's going to play for as long as he wants to play as well. But it's not even necessarily about the personnel. I think theirs is about the scheme. I think it's a, a scheme offense that you yeah. can go out there and even without – your best receiver, you're going to have a productive day. Yeah, I mean, and because it, it all it does all go back to the quarterback and Hinton Hooker's unbelievable, best deep ball in the country. That was validated. Uh, his legs, the implied threat. Right before he came on air, I was telling Jake he just he exerts an influence over the game that is uh, gravitational. It feels like every other player on the field on both teams is kind of rotating around him and exists at his whims. It's why their fourth downs, Jake, felt so automatic and yours were so grindy and awful feeling is because their quarterback, the threat that he implies is whether shovel pass work, like it's just it it just feels so easy for him. And now you give that player, you know, now now he's playing with confidence and actual belief that they are like national championship good. And you're seeing just how high that ceiling is can get pushed when all of a sudden those guys start to think, oh, no, wait, maybe maybe we are better than than we thought preseason. And maybe we are better than the team that you know had to go to overtime against Pitt, right? Like, if this team played Pitt again today, 
Uh, those two teams played again today. Tennessee ain't going overtime. Like I, I, I would guarantee that. T- T- Tennessee is a team on the rise, and uh, you caught them on the rise, and, well, they used you as a launching pad. Uh, all right, when we get back, uh, more more breakdown of Saturday's game. Keep it locked other, off. There are other, other portions of this game uh, that I think bear mentioning here, Jake, um, as we talk about the differences in the offense, right, and the kind of threatening feel of them. And if you want to see how that can extend beyond just that side of the game and extend to how when you have great offense like that, it affects every portion of the game, every single bad decision that LSU seemed to make uh, spun out of what appeared to be an implicit lack of trust in the defense, right? Not deferring to start the game, right? You don't want to go down 7 nothing, give Tennessee that momentum. You, you, you think they're better. Okay, all three of the fourth down attempts in the first half, which again, I I actually don't hate on the other side as much, Jake. You, do, do, how do you feel about them? The first fourth down attempt where Kayshawn falls down because Emory Jones kicks back, and that's probably on the quarterback. You have to wait yeah, you for your wait for cadence. Clear. I like that. I'm okay with that because you realize your opponent. You realize what you're going to need. You're down 10. You have the play call. Like yeah. You almost got it anyways. I like the play call you had. I'm okay with that one. So they're not all created the same. Now the fourth and 10 before the half, I am all about like, just knowing what you have offensively, fourth and ten feels like fourth and thirty, right? Yeah. With with kind of the way the day had gone for you, and you know you go ahead, you pin them back, and you go into the locker room, and I and I trust me, I understand like you almost hit that one to Jeray to make it twenty to fourteen, and you're thinking in your head like, okay, I, I need to do that now because I tasted it, I had it, it was right there, yeah. And if it had been fourth and two and fourth and three, manageable. But that one right there, and then Tennessee goes so fast. Well, and, and so that's the thing, right? That's why on for the 10, it is partially because you almost tasted 2014. Now, Dre caught that ball. I think he runs in the end zone. I think it's 2014. Yeah. Uh, I think the other part of it, Jake, is they're feeling, okay, even if we punt this ball, that Tennessee is so threatening and is so fast that they might still put points on the board, even if we punt and try to pin them back. So then they're like, well, whatever, let's just try and go for it and keep the ball out of their hands completely. But that gets exactly back to my point, right? They're just in every bad decision that the LSU coaches have made, or even if you want to call it a decision where the result was bad, uh, they were all almost a direct result of the pressure applied by Tennessee's offense and a lack of trust in the defense, which was a bit surprising given that in that first half, the defense was performing better than the uh, coaching decisions would have would have had you uh, would have led you to believe. So I found that to be um, very very disappointing. Uh, one thing that I kind of liked, uh, I like Brian Thomas. <laughs> Brian Thomas is a beast, dude. If we're just looking for some bright spot in this game, Jake, I feel like the first person never gets him down. I feel like he always gets extra yardage. Probably the best yak guy on the team. Like everybody's talking about, do we need to feed touches to Booty? We need to feed touches to Bash. Well, like. The only person in my mind that has warranted feeding more touches based on the touches he's gotten has been Brian Thomas. That is the man who I would give more touches to. And he's he's made catches that, you know, he probably shouldn't have. I mean, he's, yeah. he's kind of bailing out Jaden on some of those those balls for sure. And and you're exactly right. I mean, I mean Malik Neighbors has been has been good too. I mean, it's, yeah, he's been good. I'm just talking about like in terms, but he's no, no, getting I'm saying, all but, the touches. But, but you're just we're not we're not seeing it oh, because yeah. they're not having the opportunities. Yeah, you know, you have two receivers because, like, obviously, Kayshawn right now, Kayshawn has has they've been struggling to find a way to get him the football. I know he finally gotten into the end zone, but those are two receivers that we have seen it from. Yeah, and they've made the first guy miss. They found a way even when they're covered to get open and at least create a window for the quarterback. Yeah, um, defensively, look, it's again, it's it's a bit of a tough game to try to break down uh, because of how good Tennessee is, because of the off situations you were put in from the beginning. That's a great way to break a defense. One question I did have, Jake: uh, Where will there? Where was Harold Perkins? I don't know. Yeah, I, that's something today. Unbelievable. That's something today that I, I'm going to assume is going to get asked maybe in the first two three questions. Yeah, I got I got no. I mean, that is just I, head scratching. There, there, there had to be something because he was a guy that we thought maybe was going to be the most important piece of your defensive game plan. I mean, yeah. we talked about him being 
the guy that potentially could spy Hendon Hooker, the guy that could come off the edge, the guy that could try to confuse you because he plays so many different positions. I mean, he's been at an edge rusher, a Mike linebacker, a nickel Sam. They're like, okay, in a game like this, you line him up everywhere. He can come. He can bring pressure. He can do all these things. And he was kind of nowhere to be found. And you were playing some young guys. And, you know, this was probably a game, and I think they figured that out later, like this is a game that Baskerville was going to have a better opportunity than, say, like a Greg Penn. Yeah. Because Baskerville is athletic in space, and he ended up actually, when you go back and you watch the tape, he's one of the few guys that I gave like a, a pretty big check mark to. I thought he played pretty well. And you would think that Harold Perkins would be, his skill set would just would, would that key we said to last this week. game. Yes, everything is fine. I mean, you're like, what yeah. are you like? So Penn that's, that's that going to be one of the first I don't questions. Think Perkins is missing that sack, uh, and then one of those uh, stunts of it's just yeah. And then he randomly shows up like the end of the first half on like a boundary tackle. I think he was finally in the game. Very head scratching. Anything else on this game? Brody Miller tweeting after the game. LSU loses forty to thirteen to Tennessee in the largest home defeat of Brian Kelly's FBS career, and. Largest defeat since 2000 at Grand Valley State. I was going to ask that question today, and we have obviously people inside the Bayou 4 chat that have been watching LSU football for, you know, much longer than we have. And, you know, if you remember maybe a time like that, and it is foreign land for me because during my four years, we only lost one home game. And that was our last one. (laughs) We lost in triple overtime to Arkansas. If we would have won that game, we would have not have lost a game in my four years in Tiger Stadium. Bam. It's the only time that we, you know, suffered defeat was the, the very last time. I know we didn't lose the last two years. I'm trying to remember that maybe the year before that if we would have dropped. But I remember that actually being one of the biggest points of pride uh, leaving college as well is that yeah we now, had uh we had one of the uh don't get me wrong i mean we we had some of these games we there was twice in my career maybe once that we had a game that felt like this and it was in athens in 2004 how's oh, that that game we brutal. had a, we had a game like this brutal now the sec championship game was it felt like this game now the score might not have been as bad but it felt like this game and so we we had some of those both against georgia but you know, not never at home, never at home. And, and so, like, when you have a loss like this and it's in front of your home crowd, it's in front of a crowd that was a sold-out stadium. And, like, I know there's a lot of orange in the stadium. I realize that. We can get to that later. And you hype it up and you ask people to show up, show up early, and they do. And you go out there and you have a performance like this. They're all This one's going to stick out in our minds a lot longer than going on the road in 2004 and Georgia beating the brakes off of us. You know, yeah. when you do it at home, it lasts a little bit longer. So when you're talking about this is the worst loss in his FBS history, like that, this is one that until you have a big one that you come out on the other side, that's going to be talked about. If I wanted to offer any hope uh, going forward, it is that. Oh, we did have Tennessee 2005, so we had two losses. Sorry okay. to cut you off. That's no, mon- that, was a, that was a Monday night. Both overtime losses. No, though. I'm looking right now in my – Three years of starting, 09, 10, 11, it looks like number one Florida in nine when we got it. It was 14-3, worse off. Oh, was that that game? Whatever. But that, it looks like that was uh, probably our only home loss in those three years. So ever since that moment, we were perfect. But but whatever. Um, If I had to offer some hope, I would say this, Jake. Uh, what's the old classic film maxim? It's never, you, you know, it's, it's never as good as you think it is, right. and it's never as bad as you think it is. And so... I would not expect LSU to look this outclassed and this bad again this season. Uh, However, in the same token, I now probably have less, not probably, I now have less faith that this team can look as good as they did in that Mississippi State game, where it felt like everything came together. Mississippi State continues to dominate, by the way. Uh, So so the truth of you is somewhere between those two extremes, right? And between those two extremes, you look at the rest of the schedule, you're going to be in some dogfights. And, and it starts with Florida this week. And I don't think anything's going to come easy uh, for LSU this season. But also, there's no need to, like, throw your hands up in the air and say there's no hope they'll never win another game. Like, they're not going to look this bad again, I would not expect. 
Somewhere in between. What does that somewhere in between look like coming down the stretch, right? Because you have some opponents where you're going to be an underdog. You got some that maybe you're going to be favored. You got one coming up that I think is a winnable game. But if that somewhere in between isn't met, then you're not going to get the victories you want to get. Yeah. Like you got to be consistent down the stretch, regardless of opponent.